This is the Redeeming Productivity Show, where we talk about technology, techniques, and theology in the light of Scripture to help Christians get more done and get it done like Christians. I'm your host, Reagan Rose. Hey, welcome to the third episode of the Redeeming Productivity Show. We've got a good one for you today. We're going to be talking about kind of the philosophy behind this program and why we need a distinctly Christian approach to productivity. I'm excited to get into it with you. But before we do get started, I wanted to say thank you to everybody who has um, listened or subscribed or left kind notes and, and let me know that you appreciate the program. That's really encouraging, really helpful. So uh, and if you haven't subscribed, do so if you like the show. And, uh, and if you like it, leave a review. That's helpful, helps other people find out about it. And it gives me warm fuzzies in my heart. Okay, so let's get into it. I realized I started this show with the first episode on like seminary students in this hyper specific area. And I gave you some background about what the program's about and how I got interested in productivity. But I feel like I didn't really tell you at all about kind of what I'm trying to accomplish um, in a broad sense with this program. And so I wanted to do that today. I wanted in this third episode for us to talk about why it is that we need a distinctly Christian approach to productivity, and by which I mean why we can't just take whatever secular productivity books there are out there and just be okay with whatever they're teaching. Uh, I'm trying to uh, show why I'm even writing on productivity or doing a podcast on productivity or do any of this stuff. Because it's more than just taking um, secular productivity techniques and tips and tricks and trying to slap a Christian label on them. No, what I want to do and what I believe that believers need to do is do something much more radical in how we approach productivity or, or uh, as I like to figure it, whole life stewardship. How we get more done for the Lord, for his glory, why we're doing it. Um, what is the purpose of a Christian's life? How do we become more efficient and more disciplined in the tasks which our master have put before us? Like th- This is the core of what I'm getting at when I talk about Christian productivity. And so I want today to explain to you the philosophy or rather the theology behind why we need this distinctly Christian approach to productivity and do that via showing kind of some of the problems with Christians simply taking whatever the world teaches on productivity and uh, trying to adopt that and bring that in uh, without doing the necessary work of reading that through a a Christian worldview or, or, or an Orthodox theology. Um, So let's talk about that. Um, Why do Christians need a distinctly Christian approach to productivity? Are we talking, Is aren't we just talking about practical tips and tricks for getting stuff done faster, you know? Can't we just commandeer those from the business world and apply them to our lives? Is this simply just popular wisdom when we're just trying to put a Christian spin on it? No, it's so much more than that. But, but I understand it with so many excellent and helpful secular books out there on time management and productivity and 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 deep work and all these different habits all that is it really necessary to to come on here and try to quote unquote christianize productivity we all need help and we recognize that we need help in organizing our schedules and becoming more disciplined and keeping up with our our emails planning our days all of that and there is a lot of guidance, and, and much of it is good. I'm not saying it's bad, but much of it is good. But there's guidance to be gleaned from books like Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, right? Or Getting Things Done, or, or The Power of Habit, or, or Deep Work, or, or I just read, read one uh, called Atomic Habits. I mean, there's all these books out there. And you think, well, maybe a lot of these actual things on the surface, these tips, these tricks, these these things that they suggest, maybe they work equally well in Silicon Valley as they do at you know, Silver Valley Community Church. But what I want to show you today is that there are foundational aspects of the Christian's understanding of productivity which are not 
shared by the world. And if we are not careful with how we approach the subject of productivity, we are want to inadvertently imbibe the teachings and the theology of the world, which are contra what the Bible teaches. Because, hear me out, every philosophy of productivity at bedrock contains a theology. Every book you read on it, there is a theology before it. There's an understanding of what man is like, of what our purpose is, of, of, of these themes that can only be answered and are answered for the Christian in the sufficient word of God. Therefore, there is a genuine need for distinctly Christian productivity in Christ's church. But if you take the time to read any secular book on productivity, it is not long before you come up against some downright religious notions in them. It is it is without fail, honestly. <laughs> Ever since I noticed this, I find it now in every book on productivity. I try to read them as they come out, you know, any new ones. But it's not long in any of these books. I'll give you a bunch of examples here in a minute. Uh, where they're going to just flip the script. Oh man, I hate that expression. They're <laughs> going to flip the switch and go from just practical stuff to super deep stuff about why mankind even exists and why you should be doing anything with your life. And, and all the time, they talk about these things that, that uh, they may be shared. There, there may be things that they talk about that you actually share, even like even at this deep level, values that Christians share. Like a lot of these books, they promote moral qualities like, like diligence. That's a good thing. Or, or integrity, right? And just always telling the truth, always being honest, even when no one's looking. They say these are good things. They're held up as virtues. But many of the values are opposed to the word of God. So whether it's, and this comes up everywhere, the pseudo-religious law of attraction, right? That if you just think about something enough, you'll, the universe, um, which is the uh, secular person's way of depersonalizing God, the universe will make it happen for you and bring it to you. Think about money a bunch and you'll get rich. Or, or, or how they'll lionize things like vain ambition as a legitimate and appropriate motivator for life where they just like fully embrace it and they're like, you need to be at the top. You're, you're a huge alpha male. Cool dog, you're going to be the top guy at your company. You need to get rich. And like, like these things are good, like noble reasons to pursue anything in life. These books, these epistles to businessmen, they are shot through with worldliness and false religion. And that strange admixture can be a dangerous poison to a Christian who is just seeking to try to be more diligent in his walk with the Lord. And so what we need to think about and what we need to get through our heads is that there is, there are things in these books which we should better find the answers to in scripture, not in these books. And there's at the same time good things in them that we can take, but we must first establish for ourselves a foundation which is built on the scriptures, which are sufficient even for our productivity. And so here, here's our deal. We're, as a Christian reader, we're reading these secular books, and in order to apply the productivity systems presented in them, you end up having to do this whole dance where you're disentangling method from motivation, right? And... While we might dismiss this as, you know, yeah, this is just the task of Christian discernment, we, and we always need to be doing it, yes, but that untangling is, is risky business. What's wrong with a book suggesting that you should always operate with integrity in your business dealings? Because that will build trust with clients and in the end create more opportunities and, and, and more money for you. What's wrong with that suggestion? You think, great, they're promoting integrity, right? Excellent. What could be wrong with that? The problem is this, the reason that they're promoting integrity is absolutely in opposition to how the scriptures talk about it. It's not for the sake of glorifying God in whose image you were made, the God who's always operates consistently and with integrity and in accordance with his nature, who's never told a lie. And that's why you too, a creature made in his image, ought never to lie and ought always to act in an above reproach manner. No, they're calling for you to act with integrity in the service of mammon, of, of money, of, of greed and vain ambition. Being honest to get rich is far less noble than it first appears. And this is a far cry from Christian integrity. 
And think about this, on the eternal timeline, while it might make you successful now to, and in your professional life to be a person of integrity, it does nothing to glorify God and to store up for you treasure in heaven. At bottom, the, the thing that I'm critical of and the thing that I'm, I'm trying to bring out here in this podcast and in my blog and all of these things is that secular productivity methodologies tread dangerously close to religion and then tread upon religious themes. Let me, let me just throw a ton of crazy examples at you to try to prove my point that these books are often overtly teaching theological themes that are opposed to the scripture. And they're not just teaching them as a by the way thing that you can throw out. What I'm telling you is they're teaching them as the foundation to their philosophical understanding of productivity. And they're saying that their methods and their tips are built upon that foundation. Therein lies the danger. A few years ago, I was um, reading a popular Christian blogger. He recommended a book. And it was this uh, book, um, I guess I'll tell you the name of it. It's called The War of Art by uh, Stephen Prescott, Pressfield. And he said, hey, this is a helpful book for people who are in a creative space. You know, writers, artists, musicians who are trying to become more consistent in their output. And he acknowledged the secular book and he even said, hey, I haven't finished it yet, but, it, but so far I'm really liking it. And I read it. And as with all books on productivity, the first half is pretty normal. I actually took a lot away from it, and I found it really helpful on these thoughts on how to be more consistent in how I approach writing or other creative endeavors, where you're not just kind of sitting around and waiting for the mood to strike, but you're acting like a professional. That's this big thing in the book. And you just get up and you do the work and you put in the hours day after day after day, and the creativity comes if you do that and just be consistent. So yeah, that's great advice. And it was helpful and it was inspiring in a lot of ways and, and helped me. But about halfway through, this is the danger zone. I wonder too if like publishers they just know or maybe authors just know that most people that buy these popular level books like they're not actually finishing them they get a few chapters in and then it goes in the night side table and so they're just like hey about halfway through let's just throw something insane in there and just see if we ever hear about it because no one's going to read this far I don't know it's a cons- it's it's a conspiracy theory also the earth is flat so the first half of the book is like really normal and helpful But halfway through, it gets weird, super weird. Here's a quote from a section in that book entitled Angels in the Abstract. This is a quote from Stephen Pressfield's book, The War of Art. The next few chapters are going to be about those invisible psychic forces that support and sustain us on our journey toward ourselves. I plan on using terms like muses and angels. Does that make you uncomfortable? If it does, you have my permission to think of angels in the abstract. Consider these forces as being impersonal as gravity. Maybe they are. It's not hard to believe, is it, that a force exists in every grain and seed to make it grow? Or that in every kitten or colt is an instinct that impels it to run and play and learn? End of quote. What? Invisible psychic forces? Journey towards ourselves? angels. I mean, this is like pantheistic, crazy talk. It's religious notions and it's pagan religion. And he's saying, hey, this is how you need to think about your creative work. This is a far cry, obviously a far cry from Christian productivity. And it's undeniably religious talk. And, and and what I want to show you is this is not the exception. You think, well, that's that's crazy. Of course, he just picks some wild thing out of nowhere and, and wants to tell us that that's what they're all like. No, listen, I've read and listened to a lot of books and podcasts and blogs on productivity. And this kind of spiritual talk is not out of the ordinary. It is the norm. Many, many, many productivity gurus promote out and out Buddhism, spiritualism, self-deifying pep talks, um, atheistic humanism, which is also another religion, though they'd say it is not, and other overtly religious activities and philosophies as the necessary basis for their approach to productivity. Let me give you some other ones from other popular books. One of the most popular productivity books of all time 
is Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He's kind of the godfather of the productivity movement in a lot of ways. And in his book, he frequently presents veiled Mormon doctrine right alongside his tips on how to be a more effective person. I'll link to it in the show notes. There, there's a guy who's done a bunch of research on this and shows from a previous book that Covey told, said and wrote in an earlier book that that's exactly his plan, is to try to promote Roman doctrine by in, including it in the Trojan horse of teaching people about how to be more effective in their lives. He said it and he talks about it. It's crazy. I'll link to that for you. Tim Ferriss, maybe you've heard of his book, The 4-Hour Work Week, and he's done a bunch of other more uh, recent ones, The Tribe of Mentors, I think he did a year or two ago. He's really popular in this book genre, and his podcast, The Tim Ferriss Show, is like one of the most popular podcasts on productivity. And uh, I was listening to the show, um, it was maybe about a year uh, ago or so, and this was supposed to be an episode on about being an expert in your craft. And he had a, uh, I think it was a chef on, and it ended up being a one hour show on Buddhism. I'm not kidding. And I'm not just like they were saying, oh, meditation is important to me. No, this was them like going back and forth. The secular podcast, it was telling people, if you really want to be effective, you should consider um, becoming a Buddhist, a full on Buddhist. And that's going to help you become more productive. I'm just listening to this. I'm like, what? Like, and it's just totally acceptable. Other times in these books, let's take another example. Um, it's the, the issue is in what they leave out. Um, there's a popular book called The Power of Habit, um, which is a great example of this. The book purports to show how habits work. And, and so they so they can show you, if you can understand how a habit work, then you can hack the habit loop, as it were, and, and stop doing bad habits and instead replace them with good ones. And this book comes so close to explaining the, the put on, put off principle from uh, Ephesians uh, in, in the scriptures that, that you're just like, wait, is it going to become Christian? But nope, this book claiming to be uh, about um, power has no Holy Spirit has no sanctification, no cross of Christ, no new creation. The book Boasting Power is actually impotent in helping readers produce actual significant life change. Because from a Christian perspective, they've left out the most important element of life change, which is the power of Christ working in you, in your life, to transform you more and more to his image. So, like... It's not, you read this book, you say, oh, I'm going to do all these habits. And then you just, you, you read it and you inadvertently, this is why I'm critical of it is because you read this and you think this is how I change. But that's not how you change as a Christian. You don't change as a Christian by simply, by simply behaviorism, you know, BF Skinner type things. Not you change. There, there are things in there. Like I said, that there are scripture. You put, you put off the old baby, you put on the new self, but you do this in Christ's power, soaked in prayer. The, the Spirit is the one who works change in you. It's just so frustrating. Um, other, other secular books. Man, I've got so many examples. Uh, other ones, the, 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 their theology comes out in uh, how they present the ultimate goal of life. Um, in the compound effect... Uh, the author quotes his mentor saying, quote, our life is a collection of experiences. Our goal should be, should be, that's a should. Our goal should be to increase the frequency and intensity of good experiences, unquote. Okay, so what's he suggesting? He says the goal of our lives and what he's going to explain you how to do in the compound effect is to increase the frequency and intensity of good experiences. He said, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Get the most out of life. But is that really a noble goal? Is that a Christian goal? I should think not, because that's like the dictionary definition of hedonism, of setting self-pleasure in this world, of, of, of indulging in all of the experiences um, that bring you um, sensual pleasure, at making that as the highest philosophy of life. It's hedonism, and that's what's taught as the purpose of life in this book. And you'll find countless others that they say, okay, and they just assume it. Like, the goal of life is to be happy, and the way to be happy is to be more efficient and to get more done. No, it's not. 
The goal of life, I mean, of course, our happiness consists in our eternal joy uh, in knowing Christ. Yes, and in, in, in some sense, those two are joined together to glorify God. But though these don't look so different from the outside, and when you just breeze into these books, that's the real danger of it is you don't catch this stuff. And subtly, you fill in your head with all of these 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 things on productivity and you're getting great advice in a lot of ways, but you're subtly filling your head with notions about what life is like, what mankind is like, what the purpose of our existence is and what our ultimate goal is. You, we can't get that from these secular books though. Our foundation, our understanding of all these things must come from scripture. Our ultimate goal, as the confession puts it, the chief end of man, of the Christian life, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that needs to be our basis for why we're productive. And our whole theology has to come from the scriptures. You say, but the Bible doesn't talk about productivity. Au contraire. It does. The doctrine of the sufficiency of scripture says that, that the scriptures speak to all the things um, pertaining to life and godliness. And we get this from 2 Peter 1, three, which reads, His divine power has granted to us, its believers, all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So it gives us all that we need for life and godliness. It gives us all that we need, the scriptures do, so that we can live a Christian life. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 uh, through 17, it zeroes in on the source of that complete equipping as the word of God. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And the scriptures give us what we need to be equipped for every good work. Do you think that perchance that that includes equipping us with the necessary uh, theology and understanding of how and why the motivation for getting things done, for stewarding our lives well to God's glory? I think it does. And it base, it kind of makes sense when you think about it like that. It makes sense that these secular productivity books get into these subjects because when you're talking about productivity, you're talking about you are talking about the purpose of life. You're talking about getting more things done. There's there's this ambition in there. And then there's all these questions that are raised by that. Well, if I'm trying to get more done with my life, I have to answer the questions that come up from that. Why do I want to get more done? What's the goal of all of this? What it, What is the purpose of life that that goal fits under? You know, what is it that drives me? What are the motivations behind it? What is the morality? What's the right things to be doing versus the wrong things to be doing? And you can't deal with topics so basic to the human soul, like motivation, morality, and ultimate purpose, without ultimately touching upon religious themes, themes which the scriptures speak to sufficiently. And that is why we have to begin there in building our foundation. We can do this by looking to the scriptures, because Christianity offers a distinct productivity philosophy. That's the reason behind how and why Christians implement productivity techniques. The reason behind that must be starkly different than that of a secular businessman. If we can get these right, and we can by going to the scriptures, then we can better ensure that whatever methods we actually follow, whatever individual tips and tricks and ditties and 10 ways to do whatever, all of those, we can ensure that they actually follow this track, whatever ways we try to track our task lists or our calendars, that all of them are not resting on a faulty philosophical foundation, but upon the sure foundation of the word of God. So we need to be ever vigilant in our perusal of and implementation of any productivity tips that we read from the world. We don't want to accidentally imbibe their errant theology or philosophy and w which stand behind these techniques and advice. And Christians have so much more in the way of productiv productivity offered to us in scripture than we even realize. The scriptures offer this. They, they, they show to us so much about productivity. And I'll get into this in so many of the coming podcasts. And if you want to go through the blog articles, I have tons and tons of things that I've written on what the scriptures teach about productivity. But 
If we're going to glorify God, we have to have a view of time, of efficiency, of motives, of stewardship that is organically and intrinsically integrated with a thoroughgoing Christian world view. And these come from the scriptures. You find this all over. I mean, think about this. Well, the Bible doesn't speak to productivity. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Over and over again. Take the parable of the talents. There's so much to be gleaned from that about stewardship from Matthew 25 and, and the parallel in Luke 19. So much to be learned there about stewardship of our life that God expects a return on those things he's entrusted to us. There's a reason you're here on earth. There's work to be done for the master. And he, when, when he returns, expects to see you have utilized your life in a way to serve him. And he will reward you for that. Or in Colossians 3.23, the mandate for us to work heartily as under the under the Lord. That we, we're always, whether we're being watched or not, or whatever it is, we're not just doing it to please men, we're doing it to please God. Or in Ephesians 5.15-17, which talk about walking in wisdom and not wasting time. There's so much about time management. The theology of that comes from the scriptures. Or Titus 2.12, that we need to live with self-control, right? The discipline is a huge part of our lives as Christians. Or take the entire book of Proverbs. It, it, it talks about wisdom, how the art of living, how to actually live in this world um, with wisdom. There's so much in the Bible about productivity. And these all point not just to the possibility of, but the necessity of a truly Christian productivity. And let me pause here to say this. When I'm talking about Christian productivity, I am not talking about as other authors who um, purport to be Christians and may be, where they say, hey, take these, take these methods which are found in the Bible and try to apply them to your life because they're timeless principles and they're going to work for anybody. The approach to Christian productivity that I'm talking about only works and is only useful for Christians. Okay, because I'm not reaching into the scriptures. I don't think it's useful in, in, in an ultimate sense, in a salvific sense, in an eternal sense, to, to try to grasp some surface level principles from the scriptures and say, if you apply these, these timeless principles will make you uh, more profits in your business, or make you get a promotion at your work, or make you a better wife or a better husband. These things are for Christians. And what I mean by that is people who have repented of their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ as their means of salvation, that they have trusted in him by faith, trusting in his perfect obedience, the life that the perfect God-man lived, and trusting that his, his perfect death on the cross was the, the flawless substitute for us so that in him we might be forgiven by God, the Father and justified as he looks upon Christ and sees the perfect offering and the perfect uh, obedience and he counts that to us. He, by faith he credits it to us as righteousness. That's the foundation for Christian productivity is you have to be a Christian, you have to know Christ. And from there you find your, your heart being changed. You find that within you you have um, the God's Holy Spirit who he gives to all believers, we find in, in Romans 8, 9. And and the Spirit helps you to change. And and you begin over time, you you are sanctified day by day. That is more and more becoming holy, more and more becoming like Christ. And this is not without effort. This, this process of sanctification is the work of God, but he accomplishes this work through means. And the means oftentimes can be our diligent effort and, and attempts to, to be in the word daily, right? To, to, to be with him in prayer to take full advantage of the means of grace, like the fellowship of other believers or hearing the preached word. And, and by diligent effort application of, of seeking to refine our lives, to be more disciplined, to be more focused on accomplishing more of, as I said in the intro, the right things in the right way. Because our aim now as believers is to glorify God with all of our lives. That's what this podcast is about. That's what the blog is about. Christian productivity? Yeah, there's such a thing as Christian productivity. And let me just leave the final word on this episode with uh, the late Dr. R.C. Sproul. We think that because we're Christian, we do not have to be concerned about productivity. On the contrary, 
our calling as Christians is the highest calling there is. And the idea of being productive is not the invention of capitalism. It is the mandate.